Um, she, she, it's on video and she's got a note taker. She's figuring, I'm not getting out of bed. <laughs> How that? Uh, John, Tyler, first, Bill, Samantha, Andrew Liege, my liege. You guys can all look that up from a Robin Hood movie, see what that means. Uh, Joe, Phil, Patrick, Mike, when does the cast come off? Like three more weeks ago. Yeah? Okay, we'll, we'll have a party or I, something. I have Mark, Ty Tyler Second's not here. Tyler First is here, but not Tyler Second. Al and Andrew. <clears throat> okay. Uh, quick word about yesterday's lab. Easy as it was, and it looked like most everybody got good results. What happens sometimes in those type of things is, is uh, people get the X and the Y axes reversed. If you do, what happens to the reported slope? You'd what? Yeah, you'd get one over M. Now, you can check to make sure it was still right, but then you got to think, you know, my reader isn't going to want to make that step. My reader, my boss, is not going to want to fix that step that I screwed up, so I've got to reverse those and make the slope pi that we are looking for. You, you, uh, you need to look for things like that. It's very important um, what's on the x-axis, what's on the y-axis in terms of what's going to be reported as the slope. Now, I hope most of you have had a chance to look at that thing about graphing and are starting to get the idea of what we mean about chart junk. That, that shouldn't even be a new term anymore as of yesterday. Uh, not a term uh, I coined, but I think it's a superb term. It's any ink that's on a graphic that doesn't enhance the information. What often happens, and if you ever look at USA Today newspaper and the graphs they have there, uh, they always have something at the bottom of the page illustrating the, the national debt or, or uh, car crashes due to texting or something, whatever their topic of the day is. And they've got, they've got little stars on it and they've got colors all over it and they've got airplanes here and they've got bubbles and faces and cartoons and it's all chart junk. Because that doesn't enhance the information enhances the entertainment. And that's not the business we're in. We're in the business of information in here. Entertainment's great, it's just not on company time. Then you shouldn't sit there. You should sit there. I just didn't want you to think I was just like blowing your class. No, no, you'll find out very quickly. I care less whether you're, um, whether you're here or not. <laughs> You paid to be here. If you don't want to be, that's your business. I'm, we, your check is clear. All right, but I appreciate that. However, there's the best way to handle it. Right by the door, time comes, slip out. In fact, you can slip out when I'm doing this, and I'll turn back, and I'll think I'm going crazy. Because that's one of, my, one of my dominating feelings at this age anyway. Damn. Alan, sit on your hand. I have a helpful suggestion. I don't know if you've looked at the videos you've been recording. Not yet. Well, when you're standing there, you're not in the video. I don't care. I'm not at the point here. Again, again, the information's the point. Uh, appreciate that. It is hard to be a rock star if nobody knows how cool I look. But there you go. So, uh, actually, what I'm more worried about is, uh, and, and uh, I don't know about Bill. And the rest of you, it's not a worry yet. Uh, Samantha, don't worry. It's called male pattern baldness. That I'm worried about when I'm on camera. You can worry about that later. I don't, Bill, I've never seen your head. Because in the second class I've ever had, you've never not had a hat on you. I don't know. You, yeah, you, oh, yeah. Yeah, so you don't want to come up on camera. Yeah. No, yeah, that's the way it thinks, and he never goes anywhere without a hat. It's a cold. Uh-huh, uh-huh. All summer long. <laughs> yeah, until yeah, you die. Um, all right, so what we're, what we're concerned with is that chart junk. Stuff that doesn't enhance the 
the quality of the information <coughs> and its portrayal uh, doesn't belong there. We have a single line graph, so uh, you, most of you notice when we put up the data points, and then when we put up the trend line, we now had a two, two items in the legend. Well, neither one of them are in any way useful. So kill the legend, kill the grid lines. We don't need the grid lines there. Some graphs you do because you'd expect the reader to actually pull values off the graph. You want to use the line, pull the graph values off. The grid lines could be important to make sure that they travel over horizontally when they need to. Why Excel thinks of the fault of horizontal grids and no vertical grids, I don't know. God knows what's going on in the Excel office up there because there's not a brain in that, inform that organization that actually works with graphics because they wouldn't. And that it comes up with that gray background too. That's definitely chart junk. That's ink that doesn't in any way enhance the, the uh, information. So you need to clean a lot of stuff up on these graphics. Uh, another thing that will happen for some of you is uh, when the numbers come up here, uh, maybe it's something like 40.00, 20.00, 10, I guess that would make sense, it's evenly spaced with 30. Uh, that point zero zero is useless. It doesn't enhance the graphic at all. It just takes up ink, takes up space. Um, it, it, you just get rid of that stuff. Clean things up. Every little piece that you can take off of that plot leaves more prominent your results. And you want your boss to flip that page over and go, bang, there it is. Exactly what I was hoping we'd see. Excellent work. <laughs> Call you up. <laughs> Shows you how long ago I was in there. <laughs> nice job. You can, we'll let you back into the company picnic. <laughs> All right, so uh, you don't want to turn it in yet. I bet there's still some cleaning up here. Oh, yeah, no, I was just trying to find the Dropbox so when it was done. Okay. Uh, never uh, are we going to have any graphics, and I can't imagine why anybody ever would, that along with the numbers, there's not a title for what's going on on that axis. What are those numbers? <coughs> In our case, it was the, uh, the diameter of the object with units. I think most of you caught that anyway. Um, also, same thing here. Make sure that it reads sideways. You have the option of making it read like it's uh, on the outside of a a movie theater or something where the letters are going down like that. That's a very, very difficult to read. If you ever have any doubts if something's readable or not readable, hand it to one of your buddies. Say, look at this. Um, you've got three seconds to give me your impression. Because you should be able to start digesting the plot that quickly. And if you say, uh, you, you can see him struggling to read something. Fix it. Use each other. You know, here, you proofread my thing, I'll proofread yours. Get little proofreading circles. You can have proofreading potluck dinners. Internationally themed proofreading potluck dinners at each other's houses as you rotate. How fun would that be? All right, so there's lots of cleaning up to do. Would you just put the letters on there the way you mean? Oh, to run yeah, that's what, uh, uh, what we had, oh, we had circumference here. Don't do it, don't do it like that. Very difficult to read. Do it like that. Also, uh, uh, I think with several of you, I actually sh demonstrated how a simple graphic like that doesn't look good big. It looks much better smaller. Who'd I do that with? Actually did it on their screen with them. Did it with you, Len. It was, it was very true. We took two copies of the same thing, made one big, one, one small, and the small one was very much more readable. So don't make it big. It's not going to help anything. Um, lastly, before we get into the work, um, data table. Any 
anybody put one in their report so far? Good. Do you think I want to read data? Oh, guess, do you want to read data? No. I want results. Not data. Data is what you needed to get the results. And the results sometimes could appear best in a data, in a, in a table. Then it'd be a results table, not a data table. But those individual details that you accumulated yesterday, I don't care about. You need to keep that kind of thing on record because it could be that we get this beautiful result and somebody says, I don't believe it. Make it prove it. And we go traipsing down, and this will be my boss, and we'll come down to your office and say, you got to prove this. You'll pull out then your data table and say, see here? It says right there, poker chip. Quarter, basketball, and we'll say, yeah, okay. We apologize because bosses are always very willing to apologize. But I don't want to read. I don't want to read your data. That's why a lot of you asked, "What should I call this?" You were holding it and say, "What do I call this?" And I kept, "What did I say?" I said, "I don't care. So call it anything you want because so I'm not going to see it." Yeah, ring type thingy. That's what you had, I remember. All right, so any other questions? Oh, on our conclusion, do you want us to also include all the questions, or do you want that separately? Were there questions in there? Uh, just a whole bunch? Uh, percent, uh, do you percent, uh, do you oh, yeah, yeah. From, yeah, that uh, should be in there. Just in the because uh, this is one of the times when we know for sure whether our results are good or not. So you have to say whether they're good or not. By how much? Uh, if you do that equation as written, too, it'll you come up with a plus or a minus. If you were underneath, you're below by a certain percentage, and that'll be reflected because that could be important too. All right. But yeah, that 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 should be stated as part of the result because none of these results mean anything if we don't have some idea that we can put confidence into them. And if you got to pi within 0.7 percent. Uh, Pretty confident, all right? Um, there is on Angel uh, an area for discussion questions. Um, you got a question as you're sitting down to write this. Let's see, it's going to be due Tuesday, so a lot of you'll start at Tuesday at breakfast. <laughs> I'm afraid uh, that'll be a little late. But if you're, you, a lot of you have already written a bunch of. I saw. Several of you got at least halfway through a start. But if you come up with a question, put it in there. That way, uh, I only have to answer things once, not, a, not six times. Plus, everybody gets the same information, so it's a lot more fair. So, use Angel. Um, some professors actually run their classes through Facebook. Um, we, we've got Angel. We paid for it. Uh, all your other classes are there, whether your other professors use it or not, it's their business. Um, so we'll use it. We'll make use of it. All right. Any other questions on that before we go on? All right. Uh, we'll be out of here at 20 after, I promise. You got so much extra for your dollar yesterday. All right. It, uh, what will we work on as we went over time on Monday? We had so dang much fun, we just kept going. Well, what we're working on? Yeah, flip your notes back. See what we finished up, Phil. Yes, we were converting units. It's an absolutely vital skill. You've got to be able to do it. You've got to be able to do it correctly, and you've got to be able to do it in such a way that your boss is confident you're doing it well. It's a terribly embarrassing thing. I hear. <laughs> to go before your boss with some numbers and your boss says, wait a second, what are your units here? Terribly embarrassing thing now you hear. You go slopping out of, oh, you, it, that's a long walk back to your office to go fix that stuff that you should have caught in your freshman year with your great physics professor. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna do another converting units thing. However, remember, there were two things you needed to remember to convert units. What was one of them? 
What was one? What was one of them? What was one of them? No. What was? You can multiply by one. When you multiply by one, nothing changes. Well, the 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 quality of the thing changes because we're trying to change centimeters to meters or hours to lifetimes whatever it might be the quality of it will change uh, the quantity of it will change but the quality won't it's still length units to length units time units to time units etc nothing else can happen when converting units so we'll multiply by one and we'll do it as many times as we need to which we didn't hit on Monday. We did it once, but we can multiply by one as many times as we need to until we're done. What was the second thing we had to remember? That Not that you had to remember, but just that uh, it was one of those things that was just so obvious I needed to bring it to the fore. Mike? Uh, A over A equals You're going to start with something that's A equals A, but that's what's going to give you the one that you need to multiply by, because if A equals A, then A over A equals one. And that's how you pick the one in that you want to multiply by, because there's a million ones out there to multiply by. Some aren't any good, and you don't want to waste your time with them. You've got to get the right one, and it's not very hard as we'll see here shortly. So we're going we're gonna to do another unit conversion, um, one everybody's familiar with. 60 miles per hour. The speed all you guys use going down Bay Road. The speed I use on the north way. 60 miles per hour. I want to convert it to, so I'll leave myself a little bit of space. I want to convert it, convert it to, let's say, feet per second. Remember, I said that was our; those were our basic units in the English system for length and time, feet and seconds. So we want to make that conversion. <clears throat> now, remember what we do is we multiply by one. We just have to pick the right one to do the multiplying bit with, and we'll be all done. And this, if you do it this way, you never have to remember, do I multiply, do I divide? Uh, it happens a lot with the SI prefixes, kilo and million. You forget, do I multiply, do I divide? I don't know what to do. Uh, you don't need to do this. will tell you what to do. Anybody offhand know the conversion where so many miles per hour equals a certain number of feet per second. Anybody know it offhand? Who would guess it would have been Alan? Is, you, is, there, is everybody getting it? See, there'll be a, a slow migration of people as they come and sit in class until there's just this vacuum around Alan and all the weird stuff he knows. Alan, are, are you 100% are you sure you know it? Are you, I'm 100% sure I can figure it out. That's not what I ask, Alan. You have this. Alan, Alan, answer my questions when I ask them. Otherwise, we start going in six different directions. I ask a question. I want that question answered. Yes. You know. <laughs> I'll bet. I'll bet. I'll, all right. What do I put in here? How many feet per second in one mile per hour? Five thousand two hundred. No. That's how many feet no. per mile. No. No. I asked for the number. You started to give me two numbers. Do you know Andrew? Or are you uh, scared to answer now? No, I can't. No, what are you looking at? Put that away. I know. Alright. Nobody here either will admit to it, because I'll jump all over them, or don't I don't know. I don't know how many miles per hour equals how many feet per second. If I'm driving one mile per hour, how many feet do I cover in one second at that very same speed? I don't know what that number is. I don't 
carry useless information around in my head. What's a mile minute? <sighs> Great. Is that the same thing as a foot per second? No, it's not. So keep it to yourself, Alan. Well, unless it's useful. You're 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 chart junk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just seeing how mad I get you. Yeah, yeah. I'm look. If don't think for a second. If I murder a student on camera, I'm not going to edit that out within 20 minutes. That evidence will be gone. Um, so, uh, so we need to do something else, and that's what Alan was trying to drag us to by not answering my question. We're not going to be able to do this in one step because we don't know what this A equals A thing is to start with. So we're going to have to do it in a couple steps. Maybe two, maybe more. We'll do as many as it takes. Can we go from miles to feet and get partway there? Do we know one mile equals how many feet? Alan does. <laughs> I does, because I was born in Denver, Colorado, the Mile High City. And if you go to the Capitol building, there it is right on the front step. One mile above sea level says so many feet. You're all Americans, you should know this number anyway. And it's 5,280. So there's our first A equals A that will give us our first one to multiply with. What we have to figure out is what A goes over what A. Well, we'll, we'll let the, the numbers tell us. I have miles up here. The only way to get rid of miles up here is to have miles down here. So take my A equals A, just fill it in. And I'm already a little bit closer. Now I have feet per hour. Driving 60 miles per hour, how many feet are you going to go in that hour? Here's the number to tell us. We just have to multiply that out. No guesswork. You didn't even have to guess that because you just ask, keep Alan. You might want to get Alan's uh, uh, cell phone number because if you need something useless, there's a man that's going to have it at his fingertips. Fingers off. In here, it darn well better. Could have it on silent vibrate. All right, so we're a little bit closer. We've already got feet on the top, feet on the top. All of this, remember, is we're just looking at the units. I don't care what the numbers are, and as long as I got them right, they're all going to take care of themselves. Now, can I get hours to seconds? Some of you might have it in your hand directly. Some of you might not. Doesn't matter if you don't have it directly, we can put it together. Um, an hour is, well, let's take the next step towards seconds. Let's do minutes. How many minutes in an hour? 60. 60. Most everybody knows that. You wouldn't even have to go to Allen for that one. So we just need to figure out what goes on the top, what goes on the bottom. Hours on the bottom will be canceled with hours on the top. So just fill this in. Those two things are equal, so I just multiplied by one. Hours cancels hours. We now have feet per minute. And so the last step we need to take is to get to minutes to seconds. And you don't even need to worry, dang, do I multiply, do I divide, I always forget. I always forget too, because I know I can just do this and fix it, so I don't bother remembering. Minutes on the bottom, minutes on the top, seconds on the bottom, and we're all done. Now you do exactly what the numbers tell you to do, and you've got it perfectly converted. 60 times 5280 divided by 60 divided by 60. You can't screw up here. It's 
it's the it's the foolproof unit conversion. The reason I be kind of laborious about this is because one, I could never figure it out. The first person that showed me unit conversion was my high school chemistry professor, and he loved to make it look like it was some magical thing. Oh, I just do this and this and this and this and this, and we're all. How, how do you how do you know do that and that and that and that? I can I just, it took me years to finally figure out. No, I got what he's doing. It's this simple. I don't want you to think this is magic. It isn't. This is this is uh, this is the engineering equivalent of tying your shoes. You got to know how to do this, or you're gonna, at the least, look like a fool in front of your boss. Boss, at the worst. You're going to be brought up on criminal charges for being negligent, negligent in the design of a product that killed people. Maybe thousands. Well, stuff goes wrong all the time in engineering. It puts a lot of people in jeopardy. Sometimes it's as simple as this. I don't want that. I don't want to see your name in the news for this kind of stuff. Winning the lottery, where you thank your college physics professor in your statements where you collect a check, that I want to see. Your name on the police, the engineering police blotter, I don't want to see your name there. All right, uh, who's got this number for me then? 60 times 5280 divided by 60 divided by 60. 88. Feet per second. Sometimes, since it's one of those very, very common numbers, might be FPS. Though that makes unit conversion a little bit harder when it's written that way. So uh, we won't bother with that, but we'll recognize it if we see it. Now, <coughs> if this conversion ever comes up again, you can shortcut all of this with a new A equals A. You can say, 60 miles per hour equals 88 feet per second. You've got a, now a new A equals A, and you don't have to go through all of the steps anymore. You can even clean it up if you want and divide through by 88, so it's 1 feet per second equals whatever that is, 3 quarters of it, if you want to clean it up a little bit. You can write that in your book. Remember the tests are open book, open notes? You can write that in the cover of your book and you don't have to make the full conversion anymore. Any A equals A will work as long as it's the right one. However, we'll make it even easier than that. In the back of your book, oh my gosh, this is my book, and I have this page tagged because it's that important. Nothing but pages of A equals A's. All here for you. We're working with speed. So we look down here. Oh, we can convert angle, length, time, mass, area, volume, density, speed. Hey, there we go, speed. We were talking about miles per hour, so I look in here somewhere, there's miles per hour equals 1.467 feet per second. That's this thing right here divided through by 60. It's already done for you. Energy, power, pressure, acceleration, force. Some of the favorite words in our life from here on out. They're all here, and there's there's some there's some there, there's a hundred in here we'll never even use, but they're here. So tag that page for exams. It can save you not just ten minutes, but under the pressure of exam you could screw that up and not catch it. Now you don't. Now you now you'll get it just right. Pages of a blade. Right there for you. As my gift to you. All right. A lot of the homework problems 
practice these. This is a lot of what you need to do in this first uh, homework set. A lot of these unit conversions. So, babysit the units, watch them, write this cleanly and carefully. That's the main way students screw up, is they're just lazy with those stuff. Don't write it cleanly, don't write it carefully, don't cancel the right things at the right time. Uh, a big place to get trapped, and I think I talked about it, was when we have units that are squared. Did we do that yeah. in class? Oh, it's cute. Yeah, you have to square the A over A, the whole thing. Not just the units, but the number that goes with it also gets squared. So be careful with that. Practice it. Uh, and get this kind of stuff down right so your boss has confidence in you. Samantha, God bless you. Look at she's already tagging it. That's why she's my favorite student, right? Here. Okay. All right, on we go to more stuff. Let's get into the physics now. More of the physics. See how nicely it erases because I've preconditioned the board? That's beautiful. All right, we're gonna we're gonna open our work here on the, on the real physics. Uh, that that was that was all kind of background stuff we needed to get going. We're gonna work here to start with on what's called kinematics. Uh, specifically. We're going to start with rectilinear kinematics. Most likely to most of you a new word. So let me see if I can come up with a, uh, a clearer way to say that. Straight line. Or 1D, one dimensional motion. That's rectilinear kinematics. 1D motion. In the most simple terms, we're going to be talking about some things moving and in the way they move, but they can only move either left or right. Or up or down. But not both. It's a train on a very straight track. Just to get us started, there's 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 a, a lot of good physics that goes on in here, um, but it's also not very complex physics. So it's a really good place for us to get started. So we're going to start with that. We'll very quickly be into two D motion, which is called curvilinear. That's where things can go left or right and up or down at the same time and any mixtures thereof. Just the very same thing you do every day on the surface of the earth for the most part. Yeah, it's curved, it's really a three-dimensional space, but not locally to us it isn't. We live in a flat world, locally. We know the earth is spherical, but my building isn't. So we'll get to that. We'll do a little tiny bit of 3D motion. We won't do a lot because uh, it's the same as 2D motion for the most part, except there's another dimension added on. We won't do much with it also because it's very difficult to draw. It's difficult to take notes for it. It's difficult for me to draw at the board. It's difficult. Some people have a lot of trouble even conceptualizing three-dimensional images on a 2D surface. Think of the generations to come who won't even understand what a two-dimensional movie is. It all everything's 3D. Good Morning America on television. Kathy Lee Gifford in three dimensions. <laughs> wow. Can life get any better? Alright, so we're gonna we're gonna start with this. Kinematics in specifics is nothing more than the motion itself. So we have to start with two things to get started with this. The, there's, there's four parts really as far as we're concerned with kinematics. We need just two of them to get going and then the other two will come very quickly to us. The 
first thing we need is the concept of time. That as we're talking about objects moving in whatever fashion, we need to know when they're somewhere that we're talking about. Well, there's the other thing we need is position. We need to know where something is and when it's there, or we can't even get started on kinematics. So those are the two things we're going to start with. When something is where it is. All right. Uh, time's easy enough, because we can do that with a stopwatch. We'll talk about seconds to represent time, maybe minutes. We do some planetary problems, so maybe it makes sense to talk about hours or days or years even. Even centuries could come into some of this, but it's, you all got it, and you know how to get it. You look at your watch. By the way, this is a, a watch. A lot of you don't even know what these are anymore. Or you pull out your, your cell phone. Most of them have a, a, a stopwatch uh, function in them, a stopwatch tool. And if you want to use that over in lab when we're timing something, great. Works fine. So uh, that's not a big deal, uh, but we will give it a variable letter T. Just, just to show how creative we are. Alan, you have that function, you need to go get a new phone. I don't see it. Ah, oh, man. See, you cheapskate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, position. Uh, well, we got to give it some we got to give it some variable letter too. Uh, maybe if we're talking about right motion and left motion, X will work because you're pretty used to that. Maybe if we're talking about up and down motion only, we should use Y because you're pretty used to that. But it doesn't need to be. It doesn't matter what we call it. We can be as generic or specific as we want with it. So just to put something down, uh, I'll say S. That's general. Uh, if you want to use X when we're talking about horizontal motion, no sweat. I know what it means. I'll catch it. You want to use Y for up and down. In lab, next week, we're just going to do some up and down motion only, and it may make sense to do Y, because we're used to it. No trouble. No trouble. All right, so, so time, no big deal that we have to worry about. Um, but uh, position, that takes a little bit more definition. Position has got to be measured from somewhere. If, if you're going to tell me you're two miles away, i got to know two miles away what? From where? If you don't tell me, the two miles is meaningless. Yeah, you've got a number there. Two, I understand. The units, I understand. But I don't know where to measure it from. So it's no help whatsoever. So the very first thing we need to get started here is we need an origin of some kind, just a place from where we measure things. Where must that origin be? Anybody have any idea where that origin should be? What should we call the origin? Uh, I know that you're all of about the right age to think, still think that you're the center of the universe. And I know your mommy thinks you are, or the center of her universe. But I don't know if that's going to go so well in a, a math, a, a physics class with a whole bunch of centers of the universe. So where should the origin be that we're talking about? Anybody want to take a guess? John? Wherever we lost out. Wherever you... We don't want to say it's got to be uh, uh, Omaha, Nebraska, the corner of 4th and Main, because that might not be useful to our problem. It certainly wouldn't be to our, useful to our problem out here in Queensbury. Let's put it somewhere useful. So there's the first place for helping us choose where it's going to be. Let's put it somewhere useful, somewhere close to the problem. Otherwise, the numbers are going to be huge and hard to measure. Mike, got something else to add to it? I was going to say, uh, you want to put it with time is zero? Uh, we could, but we don't need to. What's easier to do is to say when the object is at the origin, 
we'll call that time equals zero. Actually, we're going to pretty much get rid of time equals zero in a second anyway. But we can say whenever we want is time equals zero. Because what we're most concerned with is not the time itself. Because, again, that has an origin. What are we going to say? The creation of the universe, which for some of you may be your belief that it was 6,000 years ago. Others of you may think it was 13 billion years ago. We're not in the class here to argue over that one. But we want the origin of the time to be local too. So we can say t equals zero, click. That's all we do with starting the watch. Time equals zero and we start it. So that's, that's got an origin to it itself. And yeah, we want a useful one uh, of that as well. Another quality of the origin that's absolutely vital Actually, we, that doesn't need to be vital. It doesn't have to be useful, but boy, it sure helps. But what, what is something that's vital for the origin in a problem? Alan, are you dying to say something and you just won't? You can say something if it answers that question. Measurable. I mean, how big it is? How well, big like the you're origin? You can't want in Omaha, Nebraska. You want it somewhere nearby. That's what useful means. Local. Well, fix it. Yeah. Uh, fix. Yeah, you don't want the origin wandering around. You know, we we start measuring one thing, and while we're concentrating on where it is and when it's there, our origin's drifting around. Can you imagine trying to measure something with a tape measure? You're off here at one end measuring it, and the jerk on the other end is walking all over. Anybody try to measure something with a little brother or sister? I bet that's exactly what they did. Butterflies to chase and, and, and dogs to pet and all kinds of stuff going on. There goes your origin all over the place. It sure helps if it's fixed. Just so uh, our, when we do make a measurement, the measurement in regards to our origin and the information we're sharing is is uh, is static, non-changing. We don't want the values to change. It'd be like a, a Harry Potter world of physics, you know, where all the pictures on the wall are always moving. It'd be like that. All the data on our page would always be moving. It'd be terrible. What else is real important with the origin? Well, <coughs> it's got to be. It's it's crucial that. I know where your origin is if you're giving me information with respect to that origin. If you tell me information of an object that is a certain place at a certain time and I don't know, I can't hang that on anything. You say it's two miles away and we're on the phone and I don't even know where you are. That doesn't help me any. It's got to be information we share. We don't have to necessarily have the same origin. Certainly, if we're doing two different pro or you're doing a problem on your paper and somebody else is doing on yours, you'll each have your own origin. But if you swapped pages and it's marked on your page, you know where it is he's talking about. It's information that's shared. Uh, so let's say the uh, the origin. Well, let's let's put this. Let's just say the origin is known. It's not a secret where the origin is. Whether it's a dot on your page with an O beside it, that works. Whether there's a signpost there saying, herein lies the origin of all things true and strong, which would, of course, be right in Denver, Colorado, where I was born. That's not only the center of the universe, that's the center of all the known universe. Mike, is that a hand up, a broken hand up? No, I was <laughs> Um, one other thing, and I'm not going to belabor the point to try to make you guess this one because it's not going to come up, uh, but it's a very important thing. It sort of ties all these other things together. It's arbitrary where it is. You're doing the same problem on your own paper. You put the origin over on the left, you put it over on the right, it doesn't matter because you're going to make it known, you're going to leave it there, 
And either way, it's useful. It's right there on the page. So it's arbitrary. That sort of ties all of these together in a way. You get to make the choice of where the origin is. When I'm doing problems at the board, uh, I'll either choose it or we'll choose it together. But I'm just going to put it there somewhere, let you know where it is, and off we go with the rest of the problem. So, uh, to start with, uh, we're doing straight line motion. There's a straight line, so we'll move along that straight line. Could do it up and down, but I'll do it that way. No reason not to. If you want to do it up and down in your paper, nothing's going to change. There's the origin. Is that an O or a zero? It's both. Because we need both. If, if an object is at the origin, its position, S, is zero. So it's going to serve as a zero and an O. That's the, that's the poetry of the universe right there. That tells you God speaks English. That he made zero and O have the same shape. All right, so there's there's O. Maybe our object is there at t equals zero. Maybe it isn't. It doesn't really matter. It depends upon the problem. Some problems start at the origin. Some problems start at t equals zero. Some don't. It doesn't matter because what we're most concerned with is not the individual time and the individual positions, but how those things change. Because that's where things are more interesting. That's what we need to do as engineers and scientists. We need to study how things are changing. How do we make things go from here to over there? How do we bring them back? If something's just going to stay where it is, be a single point, you don't need engineers. You can go get any. You can go get the business majors and they can run the world. That's how easy that is. We're engineers. We run the world. So uh, it, uh, uh, we're interested in the things changing. So let's do this. Let's put our object there. We'll call that S1 for position 1. It's there at T1. So uh, you're already getting an idea of this, uh, this nomenclature we can use. We can put a little subscripts on there to tell us when things are where they are. Notice that the two subscripts match each other. It's here at that time, and that T1 and that S1 go together. We could use a different system where those don't match. But you're just going to screw up somewhere else when you do something like that. So make sure these things match, that the things that go together go together, and we'll be all right. Let's see. Uh, we need units, so we'll call this meters. Just start throwing some numbers on here. We use nice round numbers to start with. Let's say this is three meters, and we'll start our clock there. So uh, S1 equals three meters. T1 equals zero seconds, and our, our problem begins. Some amount of time later. What, Mike? It's not there? Wait, time, time is zero? I thought the origin was zero. No, you, you said that. I said maybe. No, somebody said Who said that? Was it you? Yeah, I said maybe, but I said maybe not. It depends. If, if our object happens to be here, when we're interested in starting the problem, then let's start to watch there. Remember the origin is arbitrary. So just makes a little more sense to me because that's the first place where I have the object that that's where we'll start the time. Because maybe it took 15 years, 3 months, and 27 days to get from there to there. Do we want it, that to reflect that? Not, not for what we're doing here because the problem only just started. So let's start the watch. So that's us. We, we know where the object is. We'll start the clock there. Three meters? Oh, that's manageable. If it was three light years, 
I might want to change where the origin is uh, and redo the problem from there. But again, the origin is arbitrary. Put it someplace useful. It's useful to start the clock right there at S1. All right, some amount of time later, and again, just to keep things simple, we're working whole numbers. It's here. That looks like uh, S2 is about, what's that look like? About five meters. Just using some round numbers, keep things simple. And let's say it only took one second to get there. Now we've got uh, something a little bit more interesting going on. Because now stuff's changing. We can start to wonder why did it change? Uh, or is this a design problem I need to do? I need to make sure it gets there in one second or my design won't work? Do I need to prevent it from going there? Or my design won't work. Well, all kinds of now. We, now we got stuff to do. So we uh, well, we can even ask ourselves now. It was there at zero seconds. A second later, it was now down there. That means it was moving at least some time during that. We can ask ourselves something simple like, well, how fast was it moving? Let's see. We'll call that v. For velocity, <coughs> uh, we're a little bit we're a little bit constrained in that we only knew where it was here and here. We don't know what it did in between, so we're not going to be able to say a whole lot about how fast it was moving because we don't know what it was doing in between. Maybe it went down there, 300 meters, in the first half a second, came zipping back here, and then finally ended up here a second later, and that's the only time we woke up to check it. So we can't say in a lot of detail how fast it was moving, but we can say on average how fast it was moving. And we do that in exactly the same way you would do it, as we talked about even on Monday. If it takes three hours to drive to New York City, and it's 150 miles to New York City, what was your average speed? 50 miles per hour. You, know, you all know how to do that. Uh, distance traveled divided by the time taken. Were you always going 50? No, heck no, because between here and the north way, you went 30. You wanted to go faster, but there's cops out there. Then when you got on the north way, 85. Until you hit the first Starbucks. Got to pull in there, get a, a venti cream latte, Dooley Pacino, whoop de doo with foam. And back on the North Way. Hey, all of that stuff's incorporated in that story, but we miss all the detail because we're looking only at two points with nothing else in between. Uh, I don't want to write that every time. One thing engineers and scientists are famous for is being fantastically lazy. So we're not going to write out this stuff if we can do something shorter. So we're going to say, let's see, the time, uh, the distance traveled. Well, that's where it is now minus where it was then. And I have to do it that way. It has to be 2 minus 1. It has to be the later minus the earlier. We'll see specifically why in a second as we illustrate this. Um, and I want the same time interval 
that goes with that. So it's, if, I, if I did S2 minus S1, I got to do T2 minus T1. Let's see, what's that come out to be? S2 was 5 meters minus S1, which was 3 meters. Notice that I'm even too lazy to write the meters on both of those numbers. But we all know I could never subtract something that wasn't meters from something that is meters. So if I put meters to follow, everybody knows those are both meters. And T2 was one second, T1 uh, was zero seconds. And I'll do the math in my head for you. Average speed, two meters per second. Simple as that. Um, you know what? I'm even too lazy to write this. So I'm going to write delta S over delta T. Universally understood notation. And probably you're familiar with it. Anybody never seen that before? I'd be very surprised. It, it's... Uh, it's very, very common. It just means change in. Change in position divided by the change in time. Later minus <coughs> earlier. Later minus earlier. Always that way. Simple as that. So uh, uh, we, we go away for another coffee break. Oh, no, we already had a coffee break. So now we have to take a bathroom break. And we come back a second later. Oh. Samantha's gone. Nobody's gone to the bathroom in one second. I said, man, there's always a line out the women's bathroom that's 20, 30 people long. No way you could do it in one second. Guys were all thinking, one second, what were you doing for all the rest of the time? <laughs> so, um, sometime later, my golly, if it isn't here, here's S3 at time T3. So we'll, we'll give some, that looks like, a, we'll call this, uh, well, I can't call it two meters because in here is two meters. So I've got to call it minus two meters. Because I have to make it clear exactly where it is. To the left of the origin, We'll call that minus. You're used to doing that type of thing. That's not new, I hope. And uh, it took another second to go there. So, oh no, sorry, we're at one second. We'll call this two seconds. These time steps don't have to be even sized. It's just whenever we happen to be able to take a reading. Now, what was the average velocity? For the whole thing, or for just that stage? It says 2, 3. From time step 2 to time step 3, what was the average velocity? Delta S over delta T, I want time step 2 to 3. It's always the later one minus the earlier one. 3 minus 2. They always have to match above and below. 3 minus 2. Otherwise, you're going to have a time and a position that don't go together in the problem. Screw all kinds of stuff up. <coughs> Let's see, at S3, it was at minus 2, minus wherever it was at S2, that means minus 5. Watch the minus signs of anything. There's two things that can drag a really good student down as easy as anything. First thing is screwing up the units. If you don't watch the units, you're going to screw up. Second thing is not watching your minus signs. They're as important as anything else that we do. 
That minus sign is absolutely crucial to getting this simple, simple problem correct. And T3 was two seconds, T2 was one second. Oh man, the math is getting harder. What do we got? Uh, minus 7 divided by 2. I don't like fractions. We're engineers. We go to decimals. Minus 3.5, we'll call it. Minus 3.5 uh, meters per second. Uh, yeah. Did I do that right? I didn't do that. Oh no, it's divided by 1. I'm getting so excited here. I'm just having so much fun. There we go, minus 7. We didn't have a fraction. I was like, ah, I thought for a second we had a fraction. Yes, Alan? In this situation, if the origin is arbitrary, I mean, it may be going in that direction, but it's not really negative velocity, unless it's going up and then back down, right? It's not going up at all. This is one dimensional motion. It can't go up. Well, I'm, that's what I'm saying. If it's just going left and right, it's still, it's still a positive velocity, isn't it? Nope. Because what it did here is very different than what it did here. Here it was moving right on average. Here it was moving left on average. If we don't have the minus sign to tell us that, how are we going to know it moved this way 7 meters or went 7 meters per second farther? We wouldn't know. We'd have no idea. This minus sign tells us an awful lot of information that we need to know. It also implies direction. So that's the difference then, and you asked me this the other day, Alan, that's the difference between velocity and speed. Speed everybody's familiar with. You tell me, yeah, I'm on the north way. And I say, yeah, what's your speed? You look down at your speedometer, your speedometer, and you say, yeah, I'm going 85 miles per hour. Actually, you'd say, I'm going 85. Because that way, you know, if you're really only going along 30, and you don't want your pals to think you're a you don't grandfather, you keep the units off. So sometimes it's useful to leave the units off. But, but you're on, I'm, we're on the phone. You say you're on the Northway going 85. Is that going to be answer going to be different whether you're going north or south? No. No matter which way you're going, you're just going to say, I'm going 85. The speedometer on your car only says 85. Whether you're going north or south, or you're on the Mass Pike going east or west, or going down to Binghamton diagonally on an 88, and Five bucks to anybody knows. This is the north way. That's the through way. 88 is the what way? Nope. Not nope. Now if you're going to Binghamton, it's not the wrong way. Never had to pay out this five bucks. Crossway. Nope. South way. It's the quick way. <laughs> Did you know that? Well, no, of course you didn't. You'd be five bucks richer if you did it. It's the quick way. Anyway, your car will need read nothing but 85. Plus 85. Well, it's implied plus. There's no plus on there. It only reads 85. That's speed. Speed is simply... Uh, uh, how do I put it? Um, I'll put it this way. Uh, the magnitude of your travel. Yeah, there'll be units in there too. It's at 85, well we know it's miles per hour because you're in your car and that's what our American cars read. And nothing better on the road than a GM vehicle. Uh, velocity is different. Velocity also has in it direction. And that's why I used a V here and not an S. I wouldn't want to use an S because I already used S for position, but I didn't have to use that S for position. I could have saved it for speed 
but speed doesn't have enough information. I need V for a velocity. So this is magnitude, direction, and units. That's velocity. And that's what we're going to be most concerned with, is uh, velocity more than speed. But be careful when we use those terms, because now there's a difference. Before, there was never a difference. When you go back out in your car, there won't be any difference. You talk to the poor schmucks on the street who don't know this kind of stuff. you got to talk to them with words they understand. You're going to have to use simple words like speed, but they know what the heck you're talking about. Actually, you talk to them out there, you use the word velocity, they don't know the difference. There is a difference, and it's that simple component of direction. Because we're talking about an established origin in a particular direction. So that minus sign is absolutely... That minus sign is as important as the 7 is, in terms of the information it conveys to us. All right, uh, another quick question here. Uh, what was the average velocity from time one to time three? We did time one to two. We did time two to three. Delta S over delta T, it's always that for average velocity. What should I put? S what minus S what? The later minus the earlier. S3 minus S1. T3 minus T1. They got to match. Hey, wait, wait, wait. What happens at time two? We don't care. That's not what I asked. I asked what to do between 1 and 3. Time 2 doesn't come into it. That's the meaning of average velocity. We only take the two endpoints. We ignore everything else in between, no matter what happened. So we just fill this out from our amazing chart. S3 is minus 2 minus from the equation S1 which is 3. T3 is 2 minus T1, which is 0. Here's why I was thinking ahead of the, the dividing by. I was getting a little excited. I couldn't wait for this moment. Minus 5 meters. That's, that's the distance it traveled. Actually, we need a better word in here. We need displacement. Yeah, that's better. Because distance, how, uh, what's the distance to New York City? 150 miles. What's the distance to Montreal? Also 150 miles. There's no plus or minus on that there. We needed the minus signs in here. So displacement makes a better, uh, better, it gives us a more complete idea. And so what is that? That's minus 2.5. Did I do that math right? They check me with their calculator. Um, that's simply the average velocity between here and here. I don't care what else happened in between. Well, I might care, but it's not what we're concerned with. It's not what I asked for. All right, let's see, let's see. we got to do something more with this, because that's just too dang simple. What the heck do we need calculus for for that kind of stuff? That's just too darn simple. Let's leave that up here. So we've got, uh, we, we, well, let's make a little story out of this thing here. Here's time. Here's uh, position. We can, we can draw this out a little bit uh, at... Zero seconds, it was at three meters. One second later, 
it was up at five meters. So we'll call this one second, that two seconds. And that's all we did. So it was up here at five meters. Yeah, I got numbers. I better get units. If we didn't have numbers, we wouldn't need units. And then at two seconds, it was down at minus two meters into the depths. Right? We don't know any more than that. But you got to figure, you know, if this is a real object and it's going from there to there to there, it's not going to do it in a jerky fashion like that. It's going to kind of kind of swing between the positions, you know. As it, if, if this is a turnaround spot, it's going to kind of try to ease into it, turn around and ease out of it, and maybe pick up a little stuff. That's how you'd do it. If I wanted you to run out in the hall, do some 1D motion for me, you'd have to do it something like that. So maybe something like that makes a little more sense of what really happened for the whole time. Maybe more stuff happened. We don't know. We don't have that kind of detail, but we suspect something like this. So let's, let's go ahead and say that's what happened. Maybe there was a lot more going on but we'll leave it as something simple like that for now. Now, here's the conundrum. And this is exactly the question Newton asked himself. This is exactly the question he posted on Leibniz's Facebook page and asked him back in 1680 or something. This is exactly the question that came up to these two guys. Having to the two of them independently. They said, well, I understand that between there and there, its average velocity was, uh, what did we have it? Uh, two meters per second. I understand that the average velocity was minus seven meters per second. I understand that it takes a certain amount of time to go a certain distance and from that, we got velocity. I understand that. But what Newton and Leibniz said is, at any moment, though, it's moving. As I walk across the room, I'm moving at any moment. But at any moment, I'm not covering any distance. So how can I have any velocity at any moment? Actually, Newton didn't first propose this. Zeno proposed this. No, not Jay Zeno, the, night, the late night TV host. Zeno, the Greek philosopher, said, if at any instant we are not covering any time in an instant, or not covering any distance in an instant in time, how can we ever have any velocity? How can we ever go anywhere when we can't go anywhere in no time? And they couldn't answer that question. No one could answer that question. Zeno proposed it, I don't know what, 300 BC or something. Finally though, Newton and Galileo were able to say, Here's what we need to do. Here's what we need to look at. We know that average velocity requires a certain amount of time to travel that certain distance. Nobody disagreed with that. Not Zeno and not his grandchildren. Everybody understood that, no big deal. What they couldn't understand is how can we go anywhere in no amount of time so that we have any motion at any instant? Because an instant doesn't last any time. The definition of an instant is it's too quick. So here's what Newton and Leibniz did. They did it independently, did it about the same time. 
here's what, what they said. They said, uh, well, we need to understand that, that we're talking about delta T being so tiny, so amazingly tiny, that it's really just an instant in time. Delta T, if delta T was so small, it would be an instant, it would be a moment. So they said, let's see, let's let delta T go to zero. Let's let delta T get so vanishingly small we are indeed talking about an instant in time. So we can then indeed talk about motion at, at an instant in time itself. Notice uh, I dropped this down kind of low because the way we write it now is that we want to take the limit as delta T goes to zero. And this is exactly the question that Newton and Leibniz, Leibniz were able to now answer because they started to formulate the question in this way. You've seen this too. This is the instantaneous velocity. Notice the average subscript is now gone. Instantaneous. Does this look familiar to you people? It darn well better. What was the very first question I ever asked any of you? In fact, I asked it by email over Christmas. What's the very first question I asked about any of you? I sent everybody an email and I asked you a question about yourselves. What was it? Have you taken Calculus 1? This is why. Because this is Calculus. And this was the question everybody was asking up until then, how can there be motion in an instant of time when we can't move anywhere in no time, yet we know we're moving every motion, every instant? Exactly the question they asked. We're too dang lazy to write all this out every time. So we have an alternate notation. Let's condense all that stuff and say DSDT the time rate of change of the position is the velocity, the instantaneous velocity. That's why I needed to have calculus. There's the first piece. Time rate of change. Uh, there, just to show you how fantastic we're lazy we really are as, as engineers, I mean think about how lazy an engineer has got to be. Who, 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 design, who invented and designed a weed whacker? That's lazy. That's really lazy. A leaf blower. That's even lazier. The laziest thing in the whole world, a leaf blower. How many you got, Joe? Three or four? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's how lazy we are. We, we invent leaf blowers. Uh, this is even too much to write sometimes. So we have an alternate, alternate notation. Uh, we're talking about the position changing with time it's very commonly understood if we just say s dot that that means the time rate of change of that value s. We're having so damn much fun. What's, all right, we'll we'll stop here because uh, uh, everything from here on um, develops very very quickly anyway. Remember, though, what we mean by the delta notation. Well, remember what we mean by the D, the differential notation, the dot notation, all the same stuff. Yep? Yeah. Four main kinematics. We have time position. Oh, yeah. The last two, or, yeah. Nope. Nope. Haven't gotten to the last two. Oh, yeah. Uh, I said there were four things that we're concerned with in kinematics. There's the third, velocity. We have time, position, and velocity. And the fourth will hit on Monday.